And they thought, oh, goodness, well, she's only been at school a couple of months. What could this be about? So sure enough, she comes home for Thanksgiving and uh, brings this guy. And they get there, and the guy looks at the father and, and says, can I, sir, can I talk to you on the back porch privately? He goes, well, yeah. And of course, the mother looked nervous about what in the world just about. And so they go on the back porch, and he says, sir, I just want you to know I have, I met your daughter just, just a few months ago. I fell madly in love with her, and I want to ask for your blessing and ask her for her hand in marriage. And her father thought, wow, this is a little abrupt, but um, he said, well, let me ask you a few questions. He goes, did you, uh, do you have an education? He said, no, no, I don't have an education yet, but I have faith. I have faith in God, and I just believe God is going to provide. I said, okay. He said, well, what about a job? Do you have a, a job to take care of my daughter? And he said, no, <laughs> no, I don't have a job, but I got faith. I got big faith. I got faith in God. I think God's going to provide. He said, okay, well, he said, what about a house? You're going to have a, you got a place for you guys to live? And he said, oh, no. <laughs> no, I don't have a house. But you know, I serve a big God, and I just believe God's going to provide. He said, well, hold on. All right, I'm not going to say yes, and let me talk to my wife about this. It's a big decision. So he goes back in, of course, wife says, what's he want? He said, well, he said, what'd you learn? He goes, well, I learned a few things, actually. I learned that he doesn't, he loves our daughter, he doesn't have a job. He doesn't have an education. He doesn't even um, have a house. And he thinks I'm God. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly the call that you want. Today we're going to talk about the four calls of Christ. And we're going to find it in this. Uh, we already heard a wonderful children's sermon on Matthew 4.19. And we're going to be... Looking at that today, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Pastor Preachers love to hear pages turn. Yep. If you don't have it, just get your phone out and click to Matthew 4.19. But it's basically a verse that I have built um, my ministry now on and that I will be continuing on the rest of my days on earth to try to live this verse out. And it's a profound verse. It's one of those things that is so small and so simple that we don't see the beauty and the, uh, the complexity of it until we actually dig into it. Depending on what version you have, my version reads this way in Matthew 4.19. It says, uh, for verse 18, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were cast in a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. They, in other words, it was an average day at work. It was a normal day at the office for these guys. Nothing extraordinary. And in 19, Jesus, the words are read, it says, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Now at once they left their nets and followed him. When I used to read this, I was so astounded that this strange man could walk up to two guys at work and say, Drop what you're doing and follow me, and they would just do it. But as I began to study the life of Christ and realize kind of the three and a half year arc of his ministry life, what we see here is this really takes place about 18 months into his ministry years. In other words, he would have known them and they would have known him. This was not a stranger. His reputation had preceded him. People were coming to hear him. And these men were kind of enamored with who he was. These were some blue-collar, uneducated men. They, for them to go off to university or to study with the greatest rabbis wasn't really in the cards for them. So to have the greatest rabbi of all time come and invite them to follow him was a privilege, it was an honor. And so today I want to look at these, uh, actually four different calls that we see here in this one verse. It's brilliant, because Jesus, from the invitation, gives them the destiny and the purpose of their life. Right there in that one little sentence, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. It was about 1991, I guess, and um, I had been a Christian for just a couple of years, but I'd been a musician before that. And, and um, I was at home, and I really loved the Lord. I had just become a believer on October the 22nd, 1989. It was on the third floor of then called Athens Regional Medical Center. Uh, it was a horrific family experience that left me on my knees, and God called me to salvation right there by myself um, in a hospital room. He saved me. I found a Gideon's Bible in the drawer, and that began my journey. And just a couple of years later, though, I still did music. I loved music, but I went from the bars to the churches to do that. And um, I remember a man calling me. I got a call. Didn't know who he was. But he said, Mark, 
he talked like this, Mark. I said, yes, this Mark Manzi. Yes, he goes, this is Reverend Hewlett Hill. And I said, hello, Mr. Hill. I didn't know it would matter. And he said, I wonder if you would be willing to do music for me at a prison revival that I'm host, I'm preaching at. It's going to be Monday through Friday at Jackson County Prison. And I was living over near Athens at the time, and I said, man, I'd be honored to do it. I would go anywhere and, talk and, and, and play for the Lord. And so he said, okay, we'll be at the Jackson County uh, Prison at Monday night at 7 o'clock. That's when we're starting. So I thought, okay, I got in my little truck, got my guitar, got my hymnal. I've only been a Christian about two years, so I only knew about eight songs. <laughs> <laughs> Drove to the Jackson County Jail, and I go in, and I have my little case, and you know, I'm 22, 23 years old, and I so yeah, I'm here for the prison revival. The guy looked at me and said, okay, search my case. And uh, I said, come on back. And open the doors, you know, the buzzer, bang, doors open. And I go in and uh, they put me in this room. It was about this size. And there was a stairwell that went up. And there were cells here. And there were cells here. And, and they hit a button and everybody came out of those cells. And they all got folded chairs. And they stood there and they looked at me. <laughs> and there was no preacher. I thought, okay, I'll just start, and I uh, got my hymnal out, and I had victory in Jesus, and all that. I mean, I did, and I, I did every song I knew, and there still was no preacher. <laughs> and so finally, it got to the end, and I said, well, guys, this has been fun. They sang along, about 40 guys, I guess, there. This has been fun, but uh, I guess the preacher didn't show. We didn't have cell phones in the early 90s, yeah. you They did. They were in a bag, and they weighed about 12 pounds. <laughs> Cost you nine dollars a minute to make a car, <laughs> and so uh, I said the preacher didn't show, and so and I've sung all the songs I know, <laughs> so uh, this was great, you know. See ya later, whatever. And this one very large African American man stood up in the back and he went, "You preach." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Okay." <laughs> uh, I never preached a sermon in my life. I knew a couple verses. I knew about eight hymns. And I thought, well, I just couldn't tell how I came to know Jesus. And so I told him the story of October 22nd, 1989, at 11 o'clock p.m. at the third floor of Athens Regional Medical Center. And how the world put me to my knees. And the only place I could find any hope was in, in the God I'd heard about as a child. And folks, the whole time I was doing that, it was like I was feeling this is what I am supposed to do. Amen. This is what I'm supposed to do with my life. I stumbled into this thing. And I remember I uh, asked anybody if they wanted to receive Jesus. And this one guy did. And he came forward. And we both cried and prayed. And they went back to their cells. And I left thinking, what in the world was that? <laughs> and I walked in my little truck across the parking lot. And I hear, Mark. And I looked. And it was this man. And I said, are you Reverend Hill? He goes, I am. Where were you? I said, well, I was in the prison doing music, but I didn't, no preacher showed up. And he said, son, that's not the prison. That's the jail. The prison's this building. <laughs> and I said, oh. Well, they let me in. <laughs> I had a guy except Jesus. That's great. You know? <laughs> and he said, well, I had to preach with no music. I said, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> he goes, do you think tomorrow night you can show up in this building? And I said, I'm positive I can. And he said, okay, well, I'll see you then. That's a call that changed my life, folks. I never knew when I answered and said yes to that call, what it would mean to the rest of my life, the purpose of my life. About a year later, Reverend Hill called me and Mark, he said, he told me at the end of that week, he said, if I ever have a position at my church, Bethany United Methodist Church, would you join me? And I said, yes, sir, I would. And a year later, he called me. I got another call. I got two calls from Hugh and John. And he called me, and I became his associate pastor. I served there four years, which began my pastoral ministry. But I can tell you, folks, when you answer a call from God, sometimes you don't notice from God. I don't think that these disciples knew exactly what they were saying yes to any more than we do. But when God asks a question, the answer, the answer is yes regardless of what God asks you to do. I have learned that uh, sometimes the hard way. But in this invitation here, I think it's the same invitation that he extended to the disciples, the, these early disciples he extends to you and I. The first one is come. 
He said, come. It was an invitation to join. Uh, we call this the first call of Christ in our ministry, and this is the call to salvation. Now, for me, it was October 22nd, 1989, third floor of Athens Regional Medical Center. That was the night I accepted Jesus as the Savior of my life. But I didn't know what it meant uh, other than that. I just knew that the way things were going, ha, I, the answer to life was not inside me. It was outside of me in the person of Christ, and I needed the person of Christ to come inside of me. And so he invited me, just like he's invited each one of you. Every one of you here has a story of the day you accepted Christ, or the season of life, the day, the, the time and the space, the place isn't important, as long as you know you have. And then some of us have yet to answer that first call of Christ. Now the problem is, is once we answer that first call of Christ, is salvation, in other words, I'm spiritually dead, and I become spiritually alive, that He is the substitute for my sin, and I become the righteousness of Christ when I say yes to the Lord and come into my life. We think that's the only call there is. But it's not. It's the first of four. And that first call is not the finish line. It's the starting line. Now, how many of you would go see your loved ones in a track meet, and as soon as they got into the blocks, get ready to go, you would say, that was great, and leave? No, you want to stay. Why? Because you know this is just the beginning. The day we accept Christ is the first day of our eternal life. You see, if you've accepted Christ as Savior, you already have eternal life. You're just going to live in it on this side of the grave, and you'll be living it on the other side in heaven after that. Eternal life does not start at death. Eternal life begins for us when we accept Jesus as the Savior of our Lord. He told those disciples, come. They had a choice, didn't they? They could have said, let us get back to you. you don't call me, we'll call you. They could have said anything, but he said, come. I wonder if you have answered the first call of Christ to accept the sacrificial atonement, the gift of eternal life that Christ offers. If you have, praise the Lord, brother. Praise the yeah. Lord, sister. If you haven't, today is your day. We all had to start somewhere. <coughs> Don't let life bring you to your knees before you look towards heaven. The second call of Christ, though, comes once we've received Jesus. And this is the call to lordship. Look at this. He says, come, first call. The second one is, follow me. Jesus never asked anybody to worship him. He only asked us to follow him. Think about that. Nowhere in your Bible can you see, can you find a verse where Jesus says, hey everybody, bow down and worship me, okay? Doesn't happen. He says, follow me. Because you can't follow him without truly worshiping him. Right. It's possible to worship him without following him. Don't get stuck in that trap. Yeah. Follow him. And following means that when he goes left, you go left. When he goes right, you, when he calls, you say yes. When he says, be here on a Monday night, we go to the actual right building. <laughs> when, whatever he says do, you do it. If he says, buy this person, pay for this person's uh, groceries behind you, do it. If he says, share Christ with this individual, do it. Trust me. God... But the spiritual maturity happens when we realize that everything God is inviting us to is for our good. There's not one thing God's going to invite you into for your bad. It's for your good. And so this, this idea of following Him, we call this the call of Lordship. Now the first call of Christ is the call of salvation. It's the starting line. But the second call of Christ comes on when we answer the call to Lordship. What is Lordship? Lordship is when it finally dawns on us that Jesus is the Lord of all, including all of me. He owns all of me. He owns, he owns my house. He owns my marriage. He owns my children and my grandchildren. They're just on loan for a little while. God owns it all. Paul said, you have been bought with a price. You are not your own. And at some point in a man or a woman's life, they come to realize, wow, everything I have is a gift from God. And and I'm here to manage and steward that because every I'm not leaving here with any of it. It all belongs to God. And we answer this call of lordship. The word in Greek for Lord is kurios. You know what the word Lord actually means? It means owner. Think about that. If you have a landlord, he owns the land. And if you call Jesus Lord, be careful what you're saying. Because you are admitting 
that He owns it all. Your life, your career, your destiny, your relationships, your mind. He owns it all. And let me tell you, there is no sweeter call than the call of the Lordship of Christ. Answer that call with our life. It's a progressive call now. We're continually answering that. In the Methodist Church, we call that sanctification. Becoming more like Christ. Now, what's the first call of Christ? It's the call to salvation. But the second call of Christ is the call to live under the Lordship of Christ. But there's a third call. Look at this verse, Matthew 4, 19. Jesus said, come, follow me. Look at this. I will make you. Now, we teach this all over the world. And this is the call to discipleship. I will make you. I will teach you. I will form you. I will, I, I will I'll bring you to places. I'll, I'll set your feet here. I'll ask you to go there. He says, I will do the making. I got another call in 2014 from a district superintendent. When a district superintendent calls a pastor, uh, it's, it's not a good day. <laughs> uh, oftentimes they want you to leave, move, which means you've got to sell your house. And it's just, it's just when a district superintendent calls, you go, uh, and you go, hello. <laughs> and that's what happened to me. And he said, Mark, this is Doug Thrasher, and he was talking to me and stuff, and he said this. He said, I wonder if you'll do me a favor. I thought, oh, Lord. What is it? And he said, the Methodist Church in Russia, now in Georgia, we have two conferences, the North and the South. <coughs> Y'all had two conferences, the North and the South. In Russia, they have one <coughs> over 11 time zones. Think about that. One. Just one group, one one bishop, one leader, one seminary. And he said, they want to learn about discipleship, and I know that's your thing. And he said, would you go to Russia, to Moscow, and at the seminary there, they're looking for us to come and teach for a week on disciple making. And I said, wow, I don't know. I, I have no interest in Russia, really. I've never been there. I don't speak it. Uh, it's a long way away. <laughs> when is it? He goes, oh, a couple months. I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> Let me pray about this. I asked, talked to my wife, and we agreed this was God's calling. So we went over there. For the next four years, we have to go back and, and teach in, in Russia. And, and here's the thing. They look at America as side-eye. Now, this is the Methodist Church in Russia. These are believers in Jesus, right? This thing is happening in Ukraine, which we have pastors there too, by the way. This thing that's happening in Ukraine is not Russia. This is Putin. There are good, godly people this morning gathering in Russia to worship our risen Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. I know him personally. As a matter of fact, we have 29 pastors across Russia today uh, using our ministry as a platform. And when I was teaching this to them, they looked at me like, is this an American thing? These four calls of Christ. And then they wanted to know, is this, a, is this just a Methodist thing? They looked at me all side-eyed. And then when we were able to show them from Scripture, no, this is a Jesus thing. They were all in it. I'd be all in. There are people in Russia today who love them. Pray for the church in Russia. They are isolated. They are persecuted. If you're not of the state church of Russia, if you're a Methodist church in Russia, you are considered a cult. And there are people over there today who are risking their lives to be a part of the church. You and I, did anybody come in here under the threat of your life this morning? No. Well, around the world there are people today. And that's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. To go where he says to go. The, the first call of Christ is the call of salvation. The second call of Christ is the call of lordship. The third call of Christ is then the call to discipleship. What does that mean? Well, I can show you better than I can tell you. Well, on Tuesday mornings at 7 o'clock in my office in Roswell, there are seven men. We gather for two hours. And I teach them everything I know about how to live for Jesus. And we read scriptures, and we pray, and we impart skills, and we do accountability, and we do scripture memorization, and we are fully, fully committed to becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus took the 12, that's what we're trying to do with these small groups. Folks, there are things that sermons can't teach you. There are things you've got to experience on your own. And there's the closest thing we can find to what Jesus was calling these 12 to, this discipleship thing, is to get together. Women, get together with four or five other women once a week and talk about everything he said. And study the scriptures together and pray for one another. Love on each other. Hold each other accountable. That is discipleship. And that's the third call of Christ. Listen, if all you've done is answer the first call of Christ is salvation, but not to lordship, 
Guess what's next for you? Congratulations. A second call has come. If you've answered the call to salvation and, and the call to lordship, but not the call to discipleship, to be in a small group of committed believers to grow together, guess what's ahead of you? Pray. Well, you say, well, Mark, I don't have, know anybody like that. I don't know of a group that's committed to that. Pray. God will show you one. I promise you. I promise you. He'll answer that prayer. He'll answer that prayer. And finally, the fourth call of Christ, we see it right here in this verse, don't we? The first call of Christ is what? Salvation. Salvation. Good job. Come. The second call of Christ is what? Lordship. Lordship. Follow me. The third call of Christ? Discipleship. Discipleship. You got this. I will make you. And look at the fourth call. The fourth call of Christ. Fishers of men or fishers of people. In other words, you thought catching fish was great? Let me show you what it's like to, have, to catch somebody into the kingdom of God. That'll light your fire. That'll change your life. That'll go into your book when you write it. That is what you're supposed to do. That is the purpose of your life, he says here. If you'll come, follow me, I will make you what? Again, the fourth call of Christ is the call to purpose. Listen, if you go to Kroger today, you go to the Christian little bookstore thing even. Yeah, we used to have Christian bookstores. We don't have them anymore. We got Kroger with a little rack, right, with about ten books on it. And if you look, a lot of them wanted you to find God's purpose for your life. The best-selling book south of the, the Bible itself is a book called The Purpose Driven Life. Yep. Everybody wants to know God's purpose. I know God's purpose for your life. That sounds arrogant. You might not invite me to lunch now. <laughs> when a man comes to me or we sit and have breakfast somewhere and he you know, I'm just not sure what God wants me to do. I always go, I know. <laughs> I know God's purpose for your life. God's purpose for your life is to answer the four calls of Christ. The answer to call to say, you can't jump to the fourth call without answering the other three. Right. To come, Jesus said, the call to salvation. Follow me, the call to lordship. I will make you the call to discipleship. Fishers have been the purpose of our life. You see, the problem with the church today, and the reason it's in decline, is because we are desperately trying to get to heaven alone. We are very content with just trying to live for God, and everybody else can go to hell. We wouldn't say that, but it's what our life says. Most of us, the mass amount of men and women today in the church, are desperately, listen to me, desperately trying to get to heaven alone. God has called us to be fishers of men and women, to cast the net, to live lives that are so intriguing and so hope-filled that people go, there's something different about you. Yeah. I want what you got. Where'd you get that? What are you been smoking? I mean, whatever it is, we live lives that are so intriguing and so hope-filled that people go, you're different. You're different. What's different about you? Well, I answered the four calls of Christ. What's that? Well, let me share it with you. Matthew 4, 19. You see, folks, you can look for your purpose in your career. You won't find it. You can look for your purpose in your marriage and in your children and in your grandchildren. Hey, even in your great-grandchildren. You won't find it. You can look for your purpose in Wall Street, and your retirement account, and your golf handicap, and the biggest fish on Facebook. You can, you can look for your purpose in everything this world has to offer. And I promise you this. Listen to me. I promise you this. You will not find it apart from the purpose of God in your life. Amen. Follow God's purpose for your life. It is the best way to go. I know many men who have answered the four calls of Christ and not one of them has regretted it. Because they realize that everything God has for me or says to me or has invited me into is for my good. Now let me ask you this today. If you were to write out the four calls of Christ, and, and you know them now, right? What are they? First call? <coughs> Salvation. <coughs> call to? Lordship. Lordship. Third call is? Discipleship. And then the fourth one is? 
fishers. Purpose. Purpose. Fishers of men and people. Fishers of women. People. Purpose. God's purpose for our life. If we know those four calls of Christ, I, 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 I double dog dare you <laughs> after lunch today to write out those four calls. And then I've done this in, I don't know, hundreds of coffee shops with people individually. And then just right there with you and the Lord, or somebody you love, put a dot where you are on those four calls. I've answered this one, but I haven't answered this one yet. I've answered this one, but not this one. And you just put that, and you know what that will reveal to you? It will reveal to you what the next call on your life is, is coming. And when that phone rings, answer. And the answer is yes. Yes, Lord. And if you don't know how to find that next step, then you talk to Pastor. He'll help you. I'll help you. We'll help you again. Answer the four calls of Christ. I'll close with this question. I hope I didn't offend you when I said that the mass amount of people are trying to get to heaven once. Maybe that's not you. So let me ask you this question and then we'll pray. If God said yes to every prayer you prayed last week, if, God, if every prayer you threw up uh, to heaven, God said, yes, done. Would anybody be in heaven because you prayed that? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this great church. Thank you for this giant that we all agree, Reverend Hewitt Hill, who called me and deeply affected the course of the trajectory of my life. But Lord, I know the four calls came from you. And God, everybody today, under the sound of my voice, has received one of these calls at least, maybe two, maybe three. God, I pray today you give us the faith and the courage to say, yes, Lord, now what's the question? To put our yes on the table and you will put our yes on the map. God, I pray for every man and woman in here today who's not answered the first call of Christ. We all had to start somewhere. They would not go to bed tonight until they know that you are the Savior of their life. And once having made you, put you in the rightful place of Savior, that then they would want to follow you as the Lord of all. You are Lord of all, or you are not Lord at all. And I pray that we would surrender to the Lordship of Christ. For those who have, that the next step would be for them to find a, a small group of committed believers to grow in faith until every member of that group knows how to make disciples after. And Lord, for those of us who are here today and we are making disciples for you, we're doing what you told us to do. And we're trying. We're not perfect. But we're swinging. We're stepping up to the plate and we're swinging to the back. We're swinging for the bleachers when we come to faith. God, I pray a sense of encouragement over them. And so, Lord, wherever we find ourselves today in these four calls, above all, may we know of your great love for us, your great invitation, and that all of this would lead to your glory. And the, growth, and the growth of the kingdom of God. Thank you for this great church and the future of this church. What homecoming means of thinking about the past and the precious memories that we, that we sang of, but also what the precious future. God, help our future to be bigger than our past. Amen. And it's in the strong and able and mighty name of Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.